some days I'm a mathematician and some days I'm a biologist. So I actually have uh, a joint appointment. So um, I'm really interested in this uh, connection between mathematics and biology. And I feel like when things are going well, the biology um, helps us to think of new mathematical problems and new approaches to mathematical problems. And then the mathematics can shed light on them. And so what I, when I talk today, I'd like to kind of uh, walk on this uh, uh, edge between the two, going on one side and the other at times. Uh, mathematicians love to think about patterns and how they're formed. And um, in particular, they like to think about uh, patterns in the world around us and then how um, processes uh, give rise to patterns as an emergent phenomenon. And uh, much of the great early mathematical work in mathematical biology was looking at things like how tissues would form um, and uh, cells develop based on uh, interactions between different chemicals and stresses and strains. And here, the patterns were emergent properties based on the physical milieu. Um, I'm an ecologist, so uh, rather a long time ago when I saw this data, I was really interested. So um, these are wolves in Minnesota, and uh, my country of Canada is right at the top of the picture. And uh, there's a little sliver of Minnesota between Canada and uh, one of the Great Lakes. And um, way back in the 70s, Victor Van Dallenberg, who did his PhD, Winter Tracking Wolves, uh, caught one wolf from five adjacent packs, put a, a collar around the wolf's neck, and then flew in a fixed wing aircraft and located that wolf uh, at random times between May and October. And what you see is quite striking. Uh, each of the different symbols indicates um, one of the different wolves and uh, the convex hull shows where they moved. And you can see there's very distinct patterns and really there is very little overlap at all in their space use. And so you might think uh, these territories are um, approximately um, 150 to 100 square miles. So how do they communicate? How do they know what's theirs and what's the others? And how do they signal and uh, have these territories emerge? Interestingly, they're very stable entities. So this work was done in the 70s, but some of these packed territories are virtually the same today. And so they're inherited and passed down. This is a little closer to where I live. I live in Alberta, okay? And Alberta's just on the east side of the Rocky Mountains. And uh, we have a very healthy wolf population in Alberta, um, around 5,000 wolves. And this is Banff National Park, uh, not too far from where I live. Um, I want to start off by showing you a little bit of data, and then we'll think about the mathematics. Uh, these are data from uh, Coyotes, and this is in the Hanford Lands arid uh, uh, ecosystem. And this is actually where there's a nuclear uh, reservation. And, uh, but people are not allowed in except for scientists. Okay, so these are undisturbed coyote packs. And again, you see very distinct patterns, but now the different colors are showing the locations of a marked individual from a pack over a summer season. And we have the red pack in the middle and then blue, yellow, and so on around. And again, very distinct patterns, a little bit more overlap now between the colors, they're interleaved. And so, how are these animals signaling and, uh, and developing these territories? This is a little more data. This is from the Lamar Valley of Yellowstone. And uh, the lines show contours, okay? So this is high, and it's a U-shaped valley. But again, we see these very distinct patterns of territories, but now on the valley bottom. Okay. So we might think about this from the bottom up. Like we might say, if we can understand how an individual moves and behaves and signals and responds to other signals, can we put this into a mathematical formulation and then kind of turn the handle and then see what comes out in terms of uh, territorial patterns? And so perhaps by analyzing the patterns, 
we can then look backwards and try to infer what kinds of behaviors are going on. And we know something about the biology, uh, mainly because uh, there have been a large number of PhD students who have actually tracked wolves uh, in the winter time and uh, followed behind them and observed their behavior. So individuals forage by moving around their territory and searching for prey. And interestingly, scent marks, uh, maybe not surprisingly if you have a dog, uh, they're used to uh, transmit information. And if you're thinking about a wolf territory, um, around the edge of the territory, there'd be a kind of a bowl shape scent mark density, and the edge of the bowl is about twice as high as the middle. And this is where there's heightened marking. And existing scent marks, based on behavioral studies, elicit um, increased marking rates. And again, if you've walked your dog and seen it overmark another scent, you'll know what that means. Also, movement patterns change in response to scent marks, and so individual wolves that come up to a scent mark tend to, uh, on average, but there's a lot of variability, retreat back to their own um, uh, territory. And this is really a very interesting phenomenon. If you were to fly over northeastern Minnesota, where that original data was from, and you could see all the territories from an airplane, there'd be a patchwork of different territories. And between the territories, there'd be these buffer zones where wolves from neither pack go, and they comprise about 25% of the total area. So um, there are really these unused regions between the territories, and it turns out this is where most of the deer are found. <laughs> Not surprisingly. <laughs> and so somehow these territorial interactions are, are having an effect on the prey as well as the predator. Okay, so in case you don't have a dog, <laughs> this is a wolf undertaking a, a, a scent mark. And usually in the winter time, there, most of the data is from the winter because uh, white snow is very easy to find scent marks on. And typically, um, uh, uh, animals will scent mark on raised um, areas, uh, such as these logs or a, a bank or something like that. And there's a whole uh, description of different kinds of scent marks, and I could spend a whole lecture on those. This is called a raised leg urination. Uh, I won't, I'll just call the variable P, okay? <laughs> so I won't go into all the different kinds. Uh, this is a picture from uh, Isle Royale in one, in one of the Great Lakes. And this is one pack where um, the, uh, the uh, alpha wolf up in the top corner is inspecting a, a scent mark post after which the pack retreats into its territory on the side of the slide. This is some data closer to home. This is very close to Banff National Park. And um, we've done quite a lot of radio tracking of wolves in uh, Alberta. And these are radio lo locations taken every 15 minutes. So every dot is the location of the animal every 15 minutes. And it's got a collar around its neck, and the collar communicates with a satellite. And then it's recorded on the collar uh, where the animal is. And eventually the collar is removed, and then we download the data, and then we can see exactly where it's been, uh, basically using GPS. And so you see there's some very interesting looking uh, movement patterns here, kind of an arc shape, and then a very strong localization here. Um, and this was sort of taken over about three months. Now the interesting thing is if you overlay the same pattern with the geography, you can see there's a, the dark areas here are the valleys, and the white areas are the mountains. And the green area is a very high elk density region. Uh, which is right in the center of the Yahatenda Ranch. And you can see there is a real focus on where the prey are and the valley bottoms. And so we need to think about things like prey and topography if we're going to understand what's going on. This is a uh, picture taken from uh, the PhD thesis of um, Peters, who uh, in the late 70s spent a lot of time tracking wolves in northeastern Minnesota. And this is uh, not a, exactly data, it's like a composite of different data sets. And the little lines show trails, and then the different um, uh, colored scent marks indicate how each of the wolves is sort of marking their area, but where there's that overlap, the marking levels are higher. 
So there's sort of like this information network that comes from scent marks and then animals are somehow responding to the information that they get. Okay, so as a modeler you might say, can we come up with rules that describe scent marking and movement that are sufficient to explain the complex kinds of patterns that we observe, uh, both qualitatively and quantitatively. The qualitative question is uh, maybe what the mathematician might start with, but the quantitative question is the thing that the biologist would be interested in. And we might say, if we can come up with these rules and connect them to the data, do they do a better job of explaining what's going on than a simple statistical model? And so, to do this, uh, we need to have some kind of mathematical formulation of the equations that describe the rules that would go into what's going on, and then some kind of analysis of the equations, and then comparison to data. Okay, so a very simple model that goes back to the 1970s says basically animals that have home ranges or areas that they use, um, they, are, they sort of move randomly as they walk around or move around and uh, look for resources. And then they have some kind of attraction towards a den site or an organizing center. And so the idea is that when you have this attractive motion and this random motion spreading things out, when these two things balance, you get a home range. And we call this uh, U of X, which is uh, space and T is time. And so if we think of a, a little thought experiment and we have, say, two packs that are interacting, we'll kind of start small and then we'll build up to uh, looking at the data. Uh, say pack U is over here and pack V is over here. And then um, the first um, uh, pack uh, produces scent marks uh, P, okay, which are the promised variable there. And uh, the second one produced scent marks Q. Then the idea is that when individuals from the first pack run into the foreign scent marks, they may retreat a little bit back towards their den site. And similarly, when the pack, second pack meets these ones, they'd move back towards their den site, which would be in a different direction. So this would naturally cause the population to, to segregate. So we can put this on the computer if we want, and I'm, this isn't what I'm going to do today, but the immediate thing would be to think, okay, I can create little wolves on the computer and I can have them going around be, uh, uh, using these behavioral rules. And here's a random walk with a dense site which is shown in green and one in blue. And then these are the scent marks and then this is the heightened scent mark region. And so we ran a lot of these simulations. And, um, and we saw the kinds of patterns we were looking for. So that was a little bit encouraging. But then the question is, is there some other way we can think about things uh, mathematically that may be a little simpler, give a little bit more insight, and be more useful ultimately? And uh, this is what we did. So there are these equations called advection diffusion equations uh, that track the space use of animals. Or they can also be used to track the uh, um, density of chemicals as they um, are moved and diffused. Or they can actually be used to track the uh, temperature in a rod. Okay, so the, the mathematical theory can be used in all these different ways, but the equations look very similar. And the idea is we have the rate of change of local space use has some kind of bias term plus some kind of random term. And if I were a biologist, I'd be showing you lots of pictures of the animal that I, um, uh, I uh, study, right? And its natural habitat. So this is the animal that I study, okay? <laughs> and, um, and so it doesn't, the details don't matter too much, right? Except this is the idea. We have this sort of uh, rate of change of space use, a random um, uh, directed component, and a random component. And these different components can depend on scent marks and spatial um, variables. And so we just do a little bit more, a couple of slides of math, okay? Uh, to try to get a sense of how a mathematician would actually look at this. And so remember we had these uh, four variables, U, V, P, and Q. U was the first pack, 
P was the density for the, of scent marks for the first pack. Then we have the second pack, V, and the density of scent marks for pack V. And so these are where we really put our ideas in. And so the first term on the right-hand side in the top two equations is this random motion. It really actually comes from the idea of Brownian motion, which is kind of a random walk. And then the second terms on the right-hand side describe this movement away from foreign scent marks. And so on the top right, that C depends on Q. Q is the pack V scent marks. And then likewise for the second equation, mirror image. And then for the scent marks, you have the production. There's some low level of, um, of scent marking and then some increase in the scent marking rate based on the presence of the other scent mark. And so here we're putting the hypotheses about how animals interact and move in a very simple model. And immediately you might say, oh yeah, but that is way too simple. If you have a dog, you know it's not going to know about these equations and obey them. Um, and uh, so the idea is we're making a simple uh, kind of caricature to start with. And then if that works, we kind of build it up step by step by step. Okay. So uh, then what you would do as a mathematician is you'd say a, a few more things. Like you'd say, okay, when you get to the edge of your uh, region that you're looking at, you reflect back in. And that's what the boundary conditions say. And then you'd need some kind of function for C and M. So both of them are going to be increasing functions. And uh, C is the avoidance of foreign scent marks. And so when they're higher, you're, you move away from them faster. And M is this overmarking rate. And if there's more foreign scent mark, then you'd overmark a little quicker. And so that's what uh, the model would be. And then what you can do is you can rescale your variables a little bit. And it turns out there's really just two key variables or parameters. One is the ratio of uh, uh, directed motion away from foreign scent marks to random motion. And the other is this, this feedback in the marking rate in the presence of foreign scent marks. Those are beta and M. And so what we ended up doing was looking for saying, OK, let's put this on the computer or let it or think about these equations and then just let them run for a while. Let things settle down and see if we get spatial patterns that come out naturally. And that they'd be time independent patterns. And um, then we'd uh, analyze them a little bit and get some equations. OK, so this is what we did. We set all these time derivatives to be 0. And then we solved each of these equations plugged into the first two equations. And then we got these two coupled equations that we could then solve on the computer. So I'll just show you the pictures. And this is what you get from this very simple model. This is P, uh, sorry, this is U, this is V. And P has got the edge of the bowl on the left. And uh, Q has got that in green as the edge of the bowl on the right. So even with this very simple model, we're getting these uh, packs to uh, separate out in space. And we're getting these edges to the bowl of scent marks. And so at first glance, it looks like, yeah, um, maybe this is OK. Things get more exciting when you solve this in two spatial dimensions. And so the axes show the locations of den sites. And now the colors of the surfaces are the heights, uh, the, the densities of the scent marks. And the heights of the surfaces are the space use. So you can see there's really three packs interacting here. Uh, purple is high, red is low for scent marks. And these surfaces are kind of interleaved. And we see that they're kind of separating out. And the edges of the bowls are right here. OK, so that was fun. Uh, OK, so where does that leave us? So, and um, originally, this was just, I was kind of, I used to just be in a math department, right? I didn't, wasn't in a biology department. So a mathematician can go home and be happy and say, yeah, that was cool. That was fun. <laughs> Gain some theoretical insight, you know, it's sort of the beautiful equations. And we've got an idea of what's going on. But then I got this pesky email from someone called Paul Moorcroft. And he was a graduate student at, Har uh, at Princeton at the time. And he said, look, I've got this amazing data. I like your model. But how am I going to connect your data to the model or my data to your model? 
And can we check to see that the rules that you've suggested are actually useful as opposed to just some uh, kind of dreamed up stuff? Okay. So this was a data set that he showed me when we first got together to talk about this. And this is a data set that we saw really early on. And um, so it turns out there is a very nice and beautiful way that you can connect these models to data. And so each of the points that we saw on the previous slide are a location of the coyote or the wolf at a particular point in time. And then after a little while later, the trackers come back and they find it somewhere else. And so we think of all these data points and um, we uh, think of our model and then we use this method called maximum likelihood to fit the model to the data. And if we had a model with fixed parameters, then the likelihood is defined to be the probability that the data sample could have arisen from that model with the parameters. And then we end up choosing the parameters so as to maximize the likelihood. And then we, est we estimate the parameters. These are the, the beta and the m. And then um, see what we get. So when we do that, um, uh, we think of our locations as uh, x1, y1 in the x coordinate and the y coordinate. And then the likelihood is just the densities of the heights of the surfaces multiplied at these different locations. And so when we did that, uh, this is what we get when we fit the model. Okay, so we just have two, the two parameters. This is the two parameter model, like two degrees of freedom. And uh, we can get a very good uh, description of what's going on uh, with this mechanistic model. It's interesting that underlying the model is a lot of complex thoughts about the way animals are moving or interacting. But at the end of the day, when we're challenging it with data, we just have two things we have to work out. One is the ratio of directed motion away from scent marks to random motion. And the second is the um, uh, feedback, uh, how individuals act when they run into foreign scent marks in terms of scent marking rate. So um, that was exciting. And, uh, uh, we can, um, we can kind of look at that corner where the blue and the red and the purple come together there. That's really kind of where a lot of action is happening. And then we can think about the total foreign scent mark density that that metal pack sees. And it turns out to look like this here. So that peak uh, right at the top there is right where that interaction is. And so these are the edges of all the adjacent bowls that that center pack is seeing that modulates their movement patterns. Okay, so this is the surface and its height is uh, the foreign scent mark density. Okay, so we can make a prediction, like we can say, okay, what would happen if we remove that middle pack? And then all the other packs would kind of move in and use up space. So this is a little bit different than a statistical model because we can then say what would happen in the future if things change. And so, here, this is a prediction we made, but of course we couldn't test it because no one wanted to go and remove that coyote pack in the middle. But it turns out when we reapplied these methods to Lamar Valley in the Yellowstone, we had a, a kind of a accidental experiment that went on due to nature that allowed us to test the predictions. And I'll tell you about that soon. Okay. Um, so we might say, um, it was all this worth it somehow. Uh, you know, couldn't we have just used that Holgate model that said there was just bias towards a, a dense site and random motion? Wouldn't that be almost as good? And the answer is actually no. Uh, that's what you see on the left, the fit to that Holgate model. And it's really just like concentric rings, like target patterns for density. Whereas uh, isoclines for density here the red contours and so forth fit the data a lot better. Okay, so we were excited. We said, oh, wonderful. We've got this new data from um, Lamar Valley in Yellowstone. We fit our model and it just did an awful job. <laughs> here it is, right? So um, 
here, here are the, here are the, uh, the dots showing individuals, but here are the isoclines showing the height of the space use density. And we've got wolves right up on top of the mountain and uh, all over the place. And so, yeah, it didn't work. So, we were wondering what to do. And, well, remember we were talking earlier, right? And, and, and they, they seem to like the valley bottoms, and they seem to like to be close to their supper. So maybe, maybe there's something going on there. Maybe they don't like the steep edges, or maybe they want to be around where the prey is higher. So we put those things in the models. This is just for example, this is Hanford, where we f saw the first data, and this is this beautiful valley in Yellowstone the Lamar Valley that has that U-shaped bottom, right? And they're just kind of hanging around in the bottom of the valley. So we can, you know, we can have fun, right? So we added terrain taxes to our models, saying that wolves would try to choose a path that didn't go uphill too much and try to conserve energy. And then when we fit the model, this is what we got here. Um, and again, those contour lines show the expected uh, space use density. So. We said, okay, well, we can also work out the density of the prey. Maybe they're just honing in on regions where the prey is good and there's not much food on top of the mountains. And so we tried that too, and then this is what we got. And it turned out this was actually the best model. So it would seem from what we were doing that they were, you know, they were acting in a territorial manner, but they were trying to hone in on areas where their, their um, food was highest. Okay, and here, this is um, a little experiment we did, well, we didn't do, that happened in nature where this uh, one pack uh, actually uh, was uh, removed because um, the alpha pair died and the other coyotes um, dispersed. And uh, then we predicted how these uh, two packs should kind of move in and share the, uh, the very good region of um, food that's in this uh, area here. And then we could uh, compare that to data and show that it actually, um, the predictions were held up okay. And so just to look at this region here where you see this overlap, that's, um, that's this uh, kind of nice area right here where it's a little bit darker so there's more prey. Okay, so it turns out these um, kinds of models, this model in fact, has been applied to a lot of different animals now. This, we're kind of looking a little closer to home, I guess. This is in South Africa, in the Kalahari, in just the north part of South Africa. And there's uh, uh, these beautiful, well, interesting, I guess, uh, <laughs> meerkat uh, colonies in um, uh, rift valleys. And there's a very long-term site um, in the Kalahari, and uh, Andrew Bateman was a postdoc with me, and he'd spent time there um, collecting data on meerkats. And, um, and they're highly territorial. There's lots of social interactions. There's fighting, there's latrine posts, there's, um, um, there's apparently some kind of memory maybe of where altercations have happened earlier. And uh, the territories were much more complicated, so they were, they would, uh, uh, groups of meerkats would split, and then there would be two new groups, and then they'd be competitive, and then the, the territories would like jostle around, and then shift and drift a little bit, okay? So they weren't like anchored by a den site. They really seemed to have this dynamic feature of uh, fusion and fission and splitting and moving around. So uh, it turns out we can sort of take this whole modeling structure and apply it to animals like meerkats. And um, yeah, this is just a, a little bit hard to see with a light on, but uh, just to give you an idea, uh, there's this Y pack with a circle around it. And then um, uh, the data show that it actually broke into two packs, the uh, groups, the Y and the CD group. The CD is a red one. And then they basically spread out and they displaced other territories. And so we could fit our model to different hypotheses and to these data, and then we could show how these, uh, we could model the way that these territories would move around and grow. And 
uh, we, yeah, we've uh, used this for things like Amazonian birds uh, and uh, uh, caribou and other animals. Um, and uh, um, I'll maybe say a few more words about that later. Um, there was this thing that I mentioned earlier, though, just to shift gears, um, about uh, these uh, buffer zones. In, so we're going back to where we started, which is northeast Minnesota. And um, at, between the uh, pack territories uh, are buffer zones. And this is where the deer are more commonly found. And the, the green dots here are the locations of radio collared deer. And uh, that was, they were collected by Hoskinson. And then David Meech was collecting data on the wolves. And they were actually acting independently at that time. So they weren't uh, apparently um, working in collaboration on this. And then they kind of compared their data sets. And it's sort of interesting where you look at the green dots. They're right on the edge of the, or between the territories. Um, and then these red areas, it snows there. And um, the red areas are these yards where the deer trample down the snow under the trees and gather together. And again, see the yards are just right. You see one up in the top right there. Okay, these guys are probably in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> uh, not right in the edge of the territory. So you see there is a very strong negative correlation between these deer locations and, and the, where the wolves are found. And you can see where it is in Minnesota on the bottom right there. So, um, well, we have buffer zones. <laughs> this is, uh, that's North Korea, this is South Korea, okay? This beautiful green area here is a demilitarized zone. Um, and that's been very stable, created in 1953 during an armistice negotiations. And it excluded people in their activities for 50 years. And it turns out it's a thriving hotspot for di biodiversity in houses endangered species. Uh, but they're hard to study. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's actually a history of buffer zones in North America also. Um, there's historical records of the Sioux and the uh, Chippewa First Nations uh, having a very um, clearly delineated debatable zone. So this is Minnesota. This is Wisconsin here. And that hashed area is this buffer zone. And uh, historians have um, uh, uh, reconstructed from uh, written records exactly what the location of the buffer zone was. And also have um, carefully studied the uh, uh, density and abundance of deer in these areas. And uh, um, it was basically a stable buffer zone for about 100 years and was an uh, area of abundant game. And then there was uh, warfare and, uh, and some depleti uh, depletion of the deer. So there was something uh, similar happening there. And after, it turns out after a boundary treaty was negotiated, it was hunted out and then there was famine. Okay, so how do we understand this? I want to go back to the biology because I, I don't quite know enough about the people to <laughs> put them in my equations yet. <laughs> But how do, what do we know about, uh, about wolves and deer? Because we know we've got lots of data and this pattern is very well established. So the, there's a str very strong predator-prey interaction. So if you're a deer and you're not killed by a human, you're most likely to be killed by a wolf. And if you're a wolf uh, in northeastern Minnesota, most of your food comes from deer, something like 70 or 80 percent. And perhaps not surprisingly, then the deer are found outside of uh, the major wolf territories. But then you might think, okay, that's interesting, but why don't adjacent packs enter the buffer zones and use the deer? Why would they leave them there? Um, uh, because it turns out that the wolves in northeastern Minnesota are often on the verge of starvation. And so if you were starving and you saw your lunch there, wouldn't you just kind of step over and grab it and come back. What would prevent you from doing that? Um, and this turned out to be a real puzzle for biologists for many years. And so the idea is that, well, some people originally had some ideas like, well, uh, there's this thing called the prudent predator hypothesis. So maybe 
maybe you'd save your food until things got even worse and then go get it. Well, people don't really believe that works. And, and the other thing is, is, if you don't get it, your neighbor might get it. So there's another reason not to do that. So it's probably not, you're probably not doing that. So you might just say, how do buffer zones and hence these prey reservoirs that turn out to be really important for stabilizing the food for the wolves, how do they persist as um, ecological entities? And so really we have to think about a game in some sense. So um, the theory of games came from economics uh, where you'd have different players that are trying to maximize their fitness or their outcomes and uh, they might play against each other and try to choose um, <coughs> behaviors that are going to maximize the probability of something good happening for them or maybe something really bad not happening for them. And so if we were going to think about this as a game, uh, we uh, could think about the two packs as two players, right? And they're, they're somehow trying to choose rules so as to um, maximize their fitness. Really, there's a third player, which would be the deer. <laughs> okay, they're probably going to want to do their thing so as to ma not get eaten. I won't include them, though. We'll just think about the two packs. And it turns out there's a lot of social control over pack movement and hunting behavior. And so you can think about the pack more or less as a single hunting unit because there's um, uh, the alpha pair often um, uh, control, they control reproduction, they control hunting and a lot of other things in the pack. Okay, so, um, so what we really have here is something kind of interesting. It's, it's a spatial game, okay, because these, these buffer zones are spatial. And this just gives a little bit of a flavor of how we might think about this. And uh, here's another uh, one of those equations. But um, we might just think about what would go in there. The density for the first pack and the second pack. Maybe the density of the deer as a function of the density of the wolves, okay? And then there'd be some mortality of the wolves. And then there'd be some interaction dependent mortality. This is what alpha is. And that term, that second term in the first brackets, that's describing mortality. And we can actually measure the probability of a mortality event or a serious maiming based on data uh, when wolves interact. And then the Final term there is some measure of the offspring produced. Okay, so if you're if you're uh, if you have a strategy that allows you to produce more offspring, then you're going to be more successful, and then uh, that um, trait may be uh, continued to future generations. Okay, so this is the kind of thing we might set up here, and this is just a sample of the formula, and then what a game theory person in ecology would do is look for rules for movement behavior. Um, in terms of the bias, okay, moving away from uh, foreign, foreign scent marks or the other pack, and the diffusion, which is a random component of motion that um, is in some sense good, okay? And the people in game theory have a, um, they have a very, they're very careful with their words, okay? So they say it's uninvadable in the sense that a pack digressing from these rules will do worse, okay? So basically, if both packs are doing this uh, ESS, e evolutionarily stable strategy, and one pack does something different, it's going to do worse. So it's going to want to go back to what it did. Okay, so we can analyze this as a game. And I was tempted to give you slides and slides of mathematics, but you all might walk out on me. <laughs> so I'm just going to put it in words. Okay, and this is a, um, I think it's easy to describe in words. One thing about mathematics is if you, um, when you analyze something originally, it can look very technical and difficult. And then um, if, you, if you really understand what's going on, then you should be able to tell a story about the mathematics, uh, about what it means in terms of the biology. And that's partly what I love doing, okay, is doing the mathematics, doing the analysis, and then saying, okay, so what does that mean biologically? And so we have these two packs that play a game where each, each pack is asked to choose its space so as to maximize its fitness. And the simplest game has no constraints on movement at all. And when you put this into the machinery of game theory, what it says is that uh, each pack should divide up space 
And so it's basically uh, even space use to the middle, and then there's uh, just a, a, a wall, okay? So there's a division of space into two halves. So there's no buffer zone. And this is what we see for most countries, right? The, the demilitarized zone is something that is a little bit unusual. Um, and uh, a more complex game involves constraints on the movement parameters. And so the rules are really about the random component of motion and then the directed component of motion. In particular, if you assume that there's always some random or unpredictable component in the movement behavior, this is crucial. And so what it would mean is if a wolf came to the edge of its territory, it wouldn't actually know if it was going to go in the buffer zone or not, and neither would its neighbor, okay? So um, this is reasonable for some animals, uh, like if you're chasing a deer, maybe you'd make an incursion into the buffer zone or something like that, and you wouldn't always act predictably. Um, and so if you assume that behavior is in some sense unpredictable, then this game theory gives rise to buffer zones, providing there is a sufficiently large penalty for antagonistic interactions with other packs. And then this is how the refuge comes up. Okay, if, if everything were predictable, you wouldn't have a buffer zone in some sense. Or we wouldn't know how to, how to understand it, I should say that. Okay, so if we think about this, uh, we can think about the unpredictability of the movement here, and then the penalty for overlap here. And so at the top we have more aggressive interactions, and at the bottom we have less aggressive interactions. And so, mathematically, when we solve this problem, we have uh, basically, if, if it's uh, highly predictable, okay, and highly uh, uh, aggressive interactions, then we get a partitioning of space. And then uh, the case where uh, movement is unpredictable, but uh, there is little penalty for overlap, we get this overlap of space here. And then the last case, which is applicable to the wolves, is where we have um, aggressive interactions with neighbors and highly unpredictable uh, movement behavior. And that's where you get these uh, uh, territories separating out. So it's kind of fun to think about different animals that might have different strategies and how they might fit into this uh, um, two-dimensional uh, space. So it turns out there's this uh, beautiful uh, uh, data on badger territories um, uh, by Hans Crook in uh, Wytham Woods near Oxford. And uh, you can maybe just see the light green lines. These are the edges of the badger territories. And um, actually badgers from each set uh, can walk along the path but never step off on the wrong side. So they, they exactly touch, no buffer zone. Uh, but we have reason to believe that they're more predictable. They eat earthworms, they don't chase deer. So <laughs> their, their prey aren't going to go over the <laughs> boundary. And, um, and there's other reasons uh, based on the scaling of the territories that we think we're in this region here. Now it turns out that the, the coyote territories are really uh, in this region here where we're having these dots that kind of interleave a little bit. You know, you get the green in with the red and so forth. And then of course the, the wolf territories that we started with are are in that region there. So, um, yeah, so we're just kind of having fun with this. And then I got um, this paper to review from a bunch of mathematicians at UCLA. And, and they, had, they had been doing all this work on the mathematics of crime. And they were working with a UCLA police department on, on crime and um, um, looking at, at trying to figure out where break-ins were going to occur and so forth. And so this is a Holenbeck County in Los Angeles, um, not pretty close to Los Angeles. And um, so, and they had a lot of data working with the police department. So they had uh, 29 active groups, 69 rivalries. They had set spaces referring to where the center of activity was. And uh, they had uh, a lot of data on um, altercations and um, between different groups. Uh, that they used to fit the model. And they really just used this uh, terrain taxes coyote territory model, uh, but in a different way. So um, I don't know a lot about it. So I'm not going to say it, it's great.
but, um, but it, it seemed to do a very good job of predicting space use. And um, uh, instead of the terrain, it was the, um, uh, it was the uh, freeways and rivers that prevented movement. Okay, so those were like uh, uh, driving uh, movement patterns. And so you might, uh, you might ask yourself, why would such simple models work for complex animals such as wolves or even perhaps people? And, um, and the thing is, what we do when we create the model is we don't say we know what the wolf is thinking. <coughs> but we, what we say is that on average, over many observations, um, the balance is that you'd maybe move back into your own region, okay? But other things may happen in particular. And so uh, when you look at these kinds of models over sufficiently long periods of time and sufficiently large data sets, uh, there are the kinds of patterns that arise spontaneously in nature that we can understand with fairly simple models, even though we know uh, if we were asked to predict what an individual was doing at any particular point in time, we would have a very low probability of getting it right. And so this is part of the beauty of the mathematics. Uh, it allows you to simplify and see things through a slightly different lens than you'd normally see things through. Okay, so simple models can sometimes predict what happens for quite complex uh, data. And uh, we've applied similar approaches to Amazonian bird territories and uh, caribou uh, calving space use. Um, and uh, they're based on these advection diffusion equations. And they really came out of physics, okay? And it was somehow uh, transferring all this technology from physics to biology that then opened up this area a little bit. Um, comparisons of the models tell us which models do better to describe patterns. And so we can actually test hypotheses about behaviors by saying how well does this model fit the data compared to another model. And then we, by comparing, we can see which of the hypotheses is more likely to be correct. We can use spatial game theory. Um, and one thing I've been working on recently uh, quite a bit is uh, including uh, modeling memory and movement behavior. And initially, um, we uh, did this for wolves in Alberta. And this is a really exciting area for me. And so it, it gets much more difficult because um, you have to know exactly where the animal's been for a long time to know what it remembers. And so mathematically, this produces a lot of challenges. Um, technically, it's something that's no longer a Markov process, so because it's got all the memory all ba back to whenever it started um, traveling around its territory is important. But because we can track these animals with these uh, GPS collars uh, for often for years, and we can uh, measure where they're uh, uh, preying on deer and so forth, and uh, look at uh, animals from adjacent territories, we have a lot of information going over years, and um, sometimes we can get it every five minutes. So it's absolutely amazing, like there's this sort of uh, um, um, revolution in technology that's now driving these models, so we can really put a lot of realism into them. And so um, we have been able to uh, look at wolf movement patterns and see how their memory of where they've, their previous kill sites have been have affected their future movement patterns and so forth over long periods of time. And then we detect, uh, uh, like a mathematically detect a kind of a patrolling behavior where they tend to move around their territory um, every two weeks or so in this part of Alberta that we looked at them. And we think of this as like they're harvesting information somehow. And so there's an advantage to being able to go back and see what's happened in the interim. And, uh, and so more recently I've um, started to work on uh, the role of memory and shark movement behavior as well with a, a new group. It's a very, very new project. And so um, one of the challenges here is to make these methods available to biologists who are collecting field data who might not want to get a PhD in mathematics <laughs> to apply all this uh, material, right? So um, I ideally, we'd like to have a, a package we can put on the computer in this language called R that uh, people can just sort of pick and choose what they want and then uh, and then uh, not have to necessarily uh, get their hands really dirty with the math. 
So anyhow, thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Would you ask a question? Of course, yes. <laughs> yes. I've Um, yeah, so there have been, uh, there has been work on primates, uh, with, uh, I don't know if it's baboon, so, on, um, in fruit, par pardon me? In the Cape? Uh, no, I, no, I, I think, uh, it was not in the Cape, yeah. Um, and, uh, their movement relative to fruit trees. Oh. But, uh, these kinds of models haven't been applied. They've been other, uh, kinds of, um, more individual-based models. Um, but it could be interesting. Ah, okay. And they, their territories are very much um, influenced by the food, and the food has become more urban human food. Ah, I see. So their territories would, according to, if I understand you correctly, would be would change. Could tend to, to how, where the food is. Yeah, yeah, that would be very interesting to look at. So, um, yeah, thanks for the suggestion. I'd like to learn more about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The biologist. Yeah would use it, is it that it might point out areas where they ought to make more observations because they're areas of interest in that sort of, that sort of thing? Yeah, that would be, uh, so they could use it, they could use the models at different levels. One is, um, say, for example, a, a new species, mm -hmm. maybe not the wolves, but uh, for example, when we looked at uh, Amazonian birds using the same kinds of um, models, we, we didn't know what governed their movement behavior. Uh, so there was some territoriality, but there was the vegetation type, and there was the elevation, and so forth. And by putting those different terms in the models, then we could test to see um, which terms uh, best describe what was going on. And so use that to test a hypothesis, like, okay, things are really driven by the locations of where their food are, or something else. So in a way, that's how we've used them. Um, but also, these kinds of models can be used to say, okay, we don't really have enough information on this particular thing, so let's go back and try to do more research on it. Thanks. Yeah. I don't take credit for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess they were. Um, there could have been even more, I think, because there were like 23 gangs, and so you can have uh, yeah, a lot of rivalries. Um, these were known recorded uh, rivalries, and so, um, and so I guess the, they, there were tickets for uh, interactions uh, between known gangs that they could access in the database, and, and they referred to specific rivalries. Would they be clear up to Yeah, there was a there was a strong temporal component to it as well, which I I didn't talk about. Yeah. It's got a really yeah. fertile area here for gang studies. Right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm, if there's someone willing to do it, I'm sure there'd be uh, there'd be a lot of interesting things to look at. Yeah. 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 And and so one of the interesting questions to me is how far can you push models like this? And um, you know, uh, we initially didn't think it would work for wolves and. Um, but uh, because um, they're, they're very, uh, you know, they're not necessarily predictable as to exactly what they're going to do, but it did work well for them. Yeah. Yeah. Were there buffers in this space? Uh, there were no buffers in, in the LA data. So that was more like the coyote. Yeah. There was overlap, but uh, yeah, yeah, maybe more, a little more predictability. Yeah. 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 Well, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a really good point. So um, when we first formulated the models, we had time in there, and we're, we had these uh, time derivatives that were the rate of change of space use with respect to time, and there's something on the right hand side. And so um, we could simulate the time dependent solutions on the computer, um, and, uh, and then things would kind of settle down into a pattern after a while. And so then we said, okay, um, what if we take time out of it and look for the time independent solution that describes the uh, sort of space use behavior? Um, and so 
that would mean that uh, things do vary in time, but in the, over long periods of time, <laughs> it, there's more or less uh, a, a stereotypical uh, use of space. Yeah, so, so it's a bit of an approximation. Okay. So Yeah, yeah, so um, the, the, like the variables like say u, which be the space use for one pack, it would be the, um, the density function for space use or the probability density function. So it describes the probability of an individual being there. Um, and, uh, and so over, uh, and we assume that over time, these probabilities kind of settle down. Yeah. yeah, very good point, yeah. And that was sort of the only way we could analyze them originally. Because if we keep time in there, it gets very complicated. And we did that for a while, and we realized we could, didn't have to. <laughs> yeah. 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 Any more questions? Yeah. How yeah. Yeah. Deterministic in the direction. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question, yeah. So, um, chemotaxis, um, I'll just give a little bit of background on it for everyone, but um, uh, has been used to uh, look at the uh, movement of things like uh, bacteria, and they actually produce their own chemicals, and then they're attracted uh, typically towards them. And so there's some similarities there. Uh, but there's some differences as well. And so in, in, the, um, in, the, in the wolf model, we assume the existence of these den sites, which are real, which are organizing centers for movement. And you don't have these in the chemotaxis. So you just tend to move uh, typically up gradients of, of chemical. Movement in a fixed environment is sometimes the point of view Yeah, yeah, so in a sense it's fixed, yeah. Um, but, um, but we we did we have sort of modeled uh, another another system which I didn't talk about, which is um, a memory-based model. So, um, and we actually use that for the meerkats. Um, and so the idea is that you remember where you had altercations, and then you behave differently, uh, you move differently, you kind of avoid those areas that you've had altercations in before. And so it's like a reverse chemotaxis to the the memory of where. So you would have sort of not, not go in that area for a while. And then that memory would dissipate. And when we have a model like that, we do also get these kinds of territories that form. So there are, yeah, close analogies. Yeah, yeah. So what I showed you today um, assumed a bunch of things. It actually assumed that the pack sizes were the same. And um, we, can, we can extend it to the case where the pack sizes are different. Um, and, uh, and then there's like an asymmetry. <laughs> so the larger pack uh, actually occupies a larger area. And the smaller pack kind of gets squished out a little bit. A lot, that's what the, the models say. Um, and so there's that, and then the second thing is we're assuming that the, um, uh, the size of the, of the pack, say, don't change over the period we're interested in. And so what happens is with, uh, with wolf packs, um, typically their sizes are um, more or less constant on a yearly basis. So there's a production of pups in the spring, okay, and then, um, uh, and then there's some, uh, so over the, over the summer period, they're more or less constant. There's some dispersal of um, uh, juvenile wolves in, in the fall occasionally to, uh, they leave the pack and go elsewhere to form new packs. And then over the winter, uh, the pack size is more or less constant. And so um, we were thinking about our model as applying over uh, sort of like a three or four month period where the pack size was uh, constant. But there are longer trends like packs can grow or decay and, and prey densities can go up and down and, uh, but that's almost like on a different time scale. But of course, it would be interesting to put all that in there. <laughs> It'd uh, take a few more years. <laughs> Just one more question, I think. Yeah. Um, what strikes me is quite interesting is that you, you obviously started a study of animals, essentially. And what I find quite interesting is that obviously a lot of corporations do want to know how to study humans. Give me an example. If a corporation has like a product X, 
Mm -hmm. But it's why. Mm -hmm. Say like you have COVID and you have testing. Yeah. Are there simulations that corporations could run to see like how they can maximize the profit? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the one thing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Take, like human and uh -huh. people yeah. who are failing. If a lot of them have drank coke or bad mm -hmm. and something happens, like in the economy or something happens, can they actually increase those sales? Mm -hmm. Fascinating. <laughs> um, my personal experience with that is that um, my son took a year of science and he said, no, never, no more science, I'm going to go into business. And uh, so I've been having these, uh, and he's doing very well in business, and I've been having these great conversations with him about using things like machine learning uh, for this kind of thing. And so I, I, think, um, I think there are mathematical and computational methods uh, that can be used uh, for, for these kinds of things in terms of product placement. Um, but typically more in the machine learning end than the, than the spatial modeling end. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, this is really interesting because we sort of, this sort of came out of our workshop a little bit uh, with Dave Richardson's group on invasions and so forth, talking about um, uh, po policy for um, de dealing with the issue of introduced and invasive species. And it, it seemed like the, arg the discussion had gone from looking at the biology to looking at how we can best manage our human systems so as to deal with invasive species. And then we need some new mathematics to try to um, understand how we can produce a, a, a set of policies or a set of rules or a, a set of uh, interactions that allow people to come to solutions without um, antagonizing but working together. And so um, the hope is that we can come up with um, new ways to quantify these interactions and look for ways to um, structure policy so as to get people all pulling in the same direction. Thank you for um, accepting the talk. I suspect we've only got half the enjoyment out of it so far. The other half is going to come as we apply these new ideas to the world around us. Thank you very much. Thank you.